Matthew chapter 2. In this chapter, we're going to meet the wise men and find out who they really were. We're going to find out what Jesus did with all the money. <laughs> you know, the wise men gave him some gifts. What did he do with the gifts? Then we're going to find out Jesus was a Nazarene, not a Nazarite. What's the difference? We'll find out all of that and more. But first, let us read. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of King Herod, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who was born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. When King Herod heard it, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. Gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he asked them where the Christ would be born. They said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is written through the prophet, You, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are in no way least among the peoples of Judah. For out of you shall come a governor who shall shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called the wise men and learned from them exactly what time the star appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. When you have found him, bring me word, so that I also may come and worship him. They, having heard the king, went their way. And behold, the star which they saw in the east went before them, until it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. They came into the house and saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Opening their treasures, they offered to him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they went back to their own country another way. Now, when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his excuse me, and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and stay there until I tell you, for Herod will seek this young child to destroy him. He arose and took the young child and his mother by night, and departed into Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked by the wise men, was exceedingly angry, and he sent out and killed all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all the surrounding countryside from two years old and under, according to the exact time which he had learned from the wise men. Then that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled, saying, A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children. She wouldn't be comforted because they are no more. But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the young child's life are dead. He arose and took the young child and his mother, and came to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in the place of his father, Herod, he was afraid to go there. Being warned in a dream, he withdrew into the region of Galilee, and came and lived in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken through the prophets, that he will be called a Nazarene. <laughs> so um, we've got uh, the story of the wise men, and um, these wise men, in Greek, it's magi, and um, from which is where we get, you know, it's, it's the foundation of the word magic or magician. You might remember back in um, Daniel, when we were going through the prophet Daniel, the books of Daniel, all 12 chapters, right at the start, um, King Nebuchadnezzar, you know, had this terrible dream and wanted to know the meaning, but wouldn't say the, what the dream was. <laughs> the, the wise men were called, and these are the magicians, the astrologers, you know, the, it's, it's these people, the magi, they are called to King Nebuchadnezzar to interpret his dream, except he wouldn't tell them what the dream was. But Daniel seeks the Lord, he finds out what the dream is and the interpretation, tells Nebuchadnezzar, and you know, there's a great, all their lives are saved, it's, you can find it there in the early chapters of Daniel. And then of course, Daniel is appointed to be the chief of the wise 
men or the chief magi <laughs> and here we've got magi from the east now they could very well be from Babylon they could very well be from the same place as um, you know Daniel or they could be from Persia and yet, there were quite a few places to the east uh, in my mind I always thought the east was like Arabia you know we see um, we always see in the Christmas uh, nativity you know camels wise men coming on camels and in church history traditionally there were the you know we have the names of three of the wise men Balthazar Caspar and I always forget the third one uh, is it Malchus or something like that so we've got these three names of this apparent three wise men but that's church tradition may not be quite correct and of course we've often thought that there were three wise men because there were three gifts but actually we don't know how many wise men there were there could have been a lot of them and so who were these wise men well they were you know it's probably astrologers or they were people from another land possibly babylon just like daniel but these are people who look at the stars and they they um technically they're not seeking the lord but the lord reveals himself to them in the form of this star now the star of course is a great mystery what is this star and i don't really know um I know that over the years as a Christian, uh, you read a lot of books, read a lot of interesting articles and experts who claim to have figured out what the star is. <laughs> you know, people who, you know, they get these astronomical systems, you know, they reverse the, the planets and, you know, oh, magically on December the 25th, you know, 1 BC, all the planets line up and here's this star. So, you know, you see all of that. But when you read this um, story, it's like, it seems like a two-year process. It's, it's like Herod asks the wise men to find out the exact time the star appears, and they tell him an answer, and then he goes and kills all the babies that are like two years old and under. So it's like the star appeared two years ago or something like that. So planets don't stay lined up for like two whole years. I, I just think it's just the Lord leading them. You know, the Lord... <laughs> All of these stories are full of things that are supernatural. And it's the, look, this is the Lord coming into the world. We have a virgin birth. When we get to the stories of the nativity in Luke, there's going to be angels in the sky singing. There are a number of supernatural elements. It could be some type of uh, planetary thing, but I suspect probably just something the Lord did. And he guided them there. And so they, they noticed something. They inquired, they realized that a king is being born. So here are people who otherwise would not know the Lord, but somehow they become interested in the Lord and they seek him. And in the traditional church calendar, if you're, in a, if you're like me, you've grown up in a, attending a Salvation Army and then a Baptist church, and now, it's, we're in, and now our church is non-denominational, but it's still the same church. But uh, you know, we, we never followed a traditional church calendar. So we had Christmas and Easter, of course, but a lot of the other church calendar events we never followed. We didn't do the Lent and all that other stuff. But in a traditional church calendar like Lutheran or Catholic or Anglican Orthodox, they have these other events. And so one of them is the event called Epiphany. It's usually in January, but Epiphany is what's called the celebration of the light, or in other words, the gospel that's going to the Gentiles. So here, at the very start of the New Testament, the first people to find Jesus are non-Jewish people, Gentiles. Three, at least, wise men on camels. <laughs> and so this is what's celebrated in church as Epiphany. The light, which is the star, but a picture of the gospel going to non-Jewish people. And, you know, right at the beginning of the whole New Testament, there's a big clue. This message of Jesus is for everybody <laughs> it's one of the nicest things in my mind to think about so who were the wise men they were the magi same type of people as in the book of daniel so of course um herod cranky he doesn't like the idea that there's another king that's a threat to him he wants to kill all those babies so joseph has a dream and it's it's so urgent he wakes up in the middle of the night and grabs mary grabs the baby and they go and i don't know if you've ever been in a situation as scary as that i have not and um but some people in their lives have it's like 
The ninjas are coming in the front door and you're running out the back door to get away. The danger is that close. So Joseph takes his wife. Now, here's what's so great about Joseph. He believes the Lord, he doesn't question, and he obeys immediately. So many people question, is that you, Lord? Is that you? Next thing, King Herod's killed you all. Joseph and Mary um, are highly regarded, especially by Catholics, but by Orthodox, by a lot of Christians. Sadly, Joseph doesn't get as much uh, love <laughs> as other people in the Bible from Protestants. But this is a godly and a righteous man who hears what the Lord's saying and he just does it. And Mary was someone like that too. And uh, if he wasn't like that, I suspect you know, Jesus wouldn't have survived or God, God chose him because he was a person like that. So they escape to Egypt. And they get out of there. <laughs> and when they come back from Egypt, you know, years later when Herod is dead, they go and live in the, land, in the city of Nazareth. And we're going to finish this chapter by t explaining the difference between a Nazarene and a Nazarite. <laughs> because haven't you always wanted to know the difference? Okay. Nazarites are, are these crazy people in the Bible who never have a haircut and who never drink wine. And in the Old Old Testament, round about the book of Numbers, it described the process for, become, for being a Nazarite and if you wanted to end being a Nazarite. Now, some people were lifelong Nazarites, which means they became a Nazarite and they stayed that way their entire life. So it's a type, you, have a, you live an austere life where you don't drink wine and you don't, you, you know, you eat, you live a basic life. You don't, you don't even have haircuts. And all of this, a lot of fasting is for the glory of God. In other words, your life is devoted to God. Now, some people would do it temporarily. Paul did it temporarily in the book of Acts. Um, but lifelong Nazarites, there's at least three in the Bible that I know of, which is Samson. We all know he didn't cut his hair. He was a Nazarite. Samuel, the prophet Samuel in the Old Testament, and John the Baptist. <laughs> you know, we'll talk more about John the Baptist in the next chapter. And uh, these three were lifelong Nazarites. Well, in Israel, there was a town that got named after this idea of being you know, a Nazarite. Now, I suspect it was called Nazareth because a Nazarite lived there at some point. It's, you know, like the, the Philistine city of Gath, a person who came from Gath was called a Gittite. So, um, uh, in some kind of a funny way, people who were Nazarites, the town got named after them Nazareth or Nazareth. So that was the town. Well, Jesus goes to live in Nazareth as a little baby. Now, people who live in Nazareth can't be called Nazarites because they're not Nazarites. Only some of them are Nazarites. So people who live in Nazareth are called Nazarenes. <laughs> so it sounds complicated, but yeah, Nazarene as a town is named after, probably after someone who, who was a Nazarite years ago. So the town is named after the Nazarites. But then the people who live in Nazareth are called Nazarenes. So Jesus is the Nazarene. <laughs> and um, in, I think it was 2014, and in ISIS was in the news, the, the um, Islamic State that, um, you know, set up their own country on the border of Syria and Iraq, and they were very anti-Christian. They were using the Arabic letter N, Nun, to mark the doors of Christians. If they knew there was a house with a Christian in it, they would mark the letter N, it's, it's like a, almost like a U with two dots. And they would mark that. I think it was a one dot. It might be one dot. Like a little U with one dot. That's a N sound in Arabic. And that meant Nazarene. So um, if you're a Christian, you're a Nazarene. Not because you lived in Nazareth. Not because you're a Nazarite. But because you're a follower of Jesus the Nazarene. <laughs> so either way, you're named after Christ. You're either a Christian or you're a Nazarene. I think it's kind of cool. And so here we've got um, chapter. Jesus escapes by the skin of his teeth because his father is a righteous and a godly man. And you and I, we should be godly too. Let me pray. Father, I ask that we would be godly people like Joseph. 
Lord, that, it, that our hearts would be so quick to obey. Let the grace for that be imparted to everyone listening to me right now. Amen.